Welcome to City of Hope. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so this morning I want to touch on him being not only wonderful, but a wonderful counselor and a mighty God. Can you preach at your neighbor and say he's a wonderful counselor and a mighty God? Okay. Because how many of you know that every single problem we face in life is either a wisdom problem or a power problem? Think about this. If you've got sufficient wisdom and power, there's no problem you can't fix, right? If we've got all wisdom and, and all power, we can fix any problem, conceivable problem. And so whatever we're dealing in life with, we, we either need counsel or we need might. That's another word for wisdom is the counsel of God and might is the power of God. And so in, in the times of Jesus, there was the... The, the Jews, obviously, we, which we still have today, but they were really, they were really into power manifestations. And that's why many of the Jewish leaders would come to him and say, do a sign. Can you not just do a sign for us to prove that you are the Messiah? Then we will believe. And so the Jews were, were really tuned into getting a supernatural sign. They wanted the power of God. The Greeks or the Gentiles of the time were after philosophy or human wisdom. They, they, they wanted every new philosophy and they wanted to hear and ex him to explain. And then Paul writes in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and verse two, two, chapter 1 verse 24, and he says, But those who called by God to salvation, but to those, to us, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, Jesus is our counselor but he's also our mighty God. He is the embodiment of God's wisdom. But he's also the embodiment of the might of God, the power of God. He's both the wisdom and the power of God. He's the answer to every conceivable problem we can face in life. It's in him that we live and move and have our existence. Every treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus. Now, what is wisdom? I think we've spoke about this a number of months ago. In the, in the, in the original language, the word Sophia speaks of the wisdom, and, and Sophia literally means superior intelligence. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, my intelligence is superior to yours. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. Okay. Don't say that. Okay. But I don't know about you, I, I, I love it. How many of you like movies that's about the CIA and secret services and, and, and spy? And, and why do we like movies like that? Because you, you, you know what? The country with superior intel, intelligence, right, always wins the battle. If you know something that the other, that your enemy doesn't know, you're going to win the battle. Is that right? If you've got superior intelligence... Over the enemy, you're going to win the battle. And that's why countries like the United States spend billions of U.S. dollars on agencies like the CIA to gather superior intelligence over the enemies. And God is saying, I want you to live not by human wisdom, which is inferior, but I want my people to live by superior intelligence, heavenly wisdom, which is superior to human wisdom. Albert Einstein made this statement once. He said, a problem cannot be fixed by the same mindset that it created it. Let me preach it at this side of the congregation. Not getting the desired response. A problem cannot be fixed by the same mindset that it created it, right? So if human wisdom has created my problems, how many of you know that human wisdom is going to be inferior to solve that same problem? What wisdom do I need? I need heavenly wisdom. If human wisdom has caused my marriage to be in a chamorse, then human wisdom is not going to fix my marriage. I need heavenly wisdom to fix my marriage. 
If human wisdom has brought my finances into a woeful situation because of the decision, the way I make financial decisions, then I don't need more human wisdom to fix it. I need heavenly wisdom to fix it. I need superior intelligence because the inferior intelligence has caused the problem. If human wisdom has caused relationships to break down with siblings or with my children, or, then human wisdom will not fix it. I need heavenly wisdom. I need superior intelligence. Come on, turn to your neighbor. This one you can preach and say, you need superior intelligence. You see, why does God give us access? Why does He give us access to heavenly wisdom? He says, I want you to experience heaven on earth. I want you to experience heaven on earth, but heaven is released through my wisdom and my power on earth. And that is found in Jesus because he is the wisdom and the power of God. You see, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve chose to live not by heavenly wisdom. They chose to live by human wisdom at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said to them, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. They didn't die that same day. They lived another eight, nine hundred years maybe. But something died. But I find it interesting that the, that the tree of knowledge is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I would to think that if you eat the evil fruit, you will die, not if you eat the good fruit. But God says, whether you eat the good part of it or whether you eat the evil part of it, sometimes there's a way that seems good unto man, but the end thereof is death. Sometimes it looks good, but it's not God. Man's wisdom can seem good to us, but the end thereof is death. And they chose to live by human wisdom. But the net result of human wisdom is always death. Death to relationships, death to marriage, death to my finances, death to my health. And therefore, we need God's wisdom. We need heaven's wisdom. We need his superior intelligence. We need his counsel. And he is the wonderful counselor. David knew this. You know, in, in Scripture, in, in Proverbs 18, 14, God speaks and He says, counsel is mine. In other words, God says, counsel belongs to me. I alone hold sound counsel and sound wisdom. I am understanding and, and I have strength. And, and David understood that when he, when he gave us Psalm 1 and he said, blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of the mockers. Or stand in the way of sinners. Or walk in the counsel of the wicked. You see, I, I've got this mental picture. When we sit watching TV, oftentimes on most many TV programs, they mock God. They use the name of Jesus in vain. And once gone on. They mock the principles. They mock the, the standards, the more moral standards of Scripture, what we believe in. And when I sit long enough, when I sit long enough in the seat of the mockers, I'm going to find myself, when I stand up, I'm now next to the road that leads to sin. I'm positioning myself wrong because I was sitting in the wrong place. I'm not saying everything on TV is bad, but there's a lot of nonsense on TV. There's a lot of mocking of, of our God and our principles and what we stand for. And then the moment I stand up, I'm already at the road that leads to sin. And if I don't watch myself, I'll start walking in the counsel of the wicked. The Bible says in the last days, things that are wrong will be called right, and things that are right will be called wrong. Be careful, child of God. Because even the elect in the last days will be led astray if we sit long enough in the seat of the mockers, if we stand long enough on the way of the sinner, if we start walking in the counsel of the wicked. David says, no, 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 blessed is the man who does not do those things, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his words he meditates day and night and day and night. He will be like a tree planted by a stream of water, and his, 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 his roots will be planted into the life-giving water of my word, and his leaves will never wither. 
and he will bear his fruit in season. And everything that he does will prosper. Come on, many of you have heard prosperity teachings. When the prosperity move came here a couple of decades ago, many of us have heard saying you must do this and follow this gimmick and this formula and God will prosper you. I tell you, there's only one way to truly prosper. That is to delight yourself in the word of God and to meditate on the word of God. Then you will be like that tree planted in the streams of water. Because when you meditate on his word, you will will his will. And when you will his will, you will do his will. And when you do his will, you will prosper in whatever you do. There's no shortcut to prosperity. But meditating on the word of God. God, I need your counsel. I need your might. God, I need your wisdom. Human wisdom is not going to cut it anymore, friends. You see, the counselor wants you and I to make good decisions in life. Because good decisions leads to success in God. Good decisions leads to prosperity in God. God says in Isaiah 55, he says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And God is inviting you and I a little bit higher. He's saying, come up higher and begin to think my thoughts. Because when you think my thoughts, you will prosper in whatever you do. I want to give you my counsel. God says, I'm giving you access to my thoughts. But you're not going to find it on the human plane. You're not going to find my thoughts at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're going to find my thoughts when you seek my wisdom. Many plans are in a man's heart, says Proverbs 19. Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord is what will stand. God's counsel will stand. You see, the counsel that we listen to will determine the outcome of our lives. Come on, this is a good one to preach at your neighbor. Say, the counsel you follow will determine your outcome. You see, Israel, in Psalm 106, they actually accused, it said, they quickly forgot his works, but they did not wait for his counsel. When we don't wait for God's counsel, we're going to make wrong decisions. We're going to make mistakes. And many of the mistakes, many, you know, we learn by trial and error, Right? You know what it means? We suffer the trials of our errors. And oftentimes we do not wait for God's counsel. And as a result, we we make mistakes. You see, Israel did not wait for God's counsel. They they forgot his works. And and as a result, for 40 years, their stay in the wilderness was extended until that generation had passed away and never entered their promised land. And I look at so many good Christian people, sincere Christian people, and it seems like many times we're just walking around in circles and circles around the wilderness, and we're not entering our promised land. We're not entering the promises of God because we're not waiting for His counsel. People go today to various sources of counsel. We do. And oftentimes when, when we're in a little bit of a, stuck in a mess or stuck in a situation that we can't get out, we, we need outside counsel. We need somebody objectively that can give us input, right? And many of these sources of counsel are legitimate, and that's why Albert Einstein said, a problem cannot be fixed by the same mindset that created it. And so if you're stuck in your marriage, maybe you need somebody outside that can counsel you. If you're stuck financially, you need outside input that can correct certain wrongs in the way you think about money and steward it. And so for every aspect of life. Sometimes we need to go and see medical specialists because of a condition in our body. Maybe we need to change our diet or our our exercise plan or our routine. And so many of these sources of counsel is legitimate. Like you can go maybe to a Christian psychologist or to your doctor or to a financial advisor or to your home group, your cell group leaders, small group leaders. Or you can go to a Christian counselor or marriage counselor or to your pastor or spiritual leader. There's merit in that. But, but there's other less desired sources of counsel. Some people, when they don't know what to do, they go and read horoscopes. 
Please don't put up your hand if that's you. Or they go to fortune tellers. Or to sangomas. Or witch doctors. Or they consult with forefather spirits. And instead of the Holy Spirit giving the counsel of God to us, it is actually a demonic spirit using that medium to give us the counsel of Satan over us. And it can curse our future. Palm readers. In the olden days, baie van ons Afrikaanse mense, ons het na die huis genoot toe gegaan vir counsel. En Asari, jou six vrienden dier dikkendin. Today people run to social media and, 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 and Facebook and, and Twitter and, and Netflix and, and they are counsel. They, 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 they give input into our lives. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, if it is on Facebook, it must surely be true. <laughs> Whoever we turn to for counsel determines the outcome of our life. And that's why Paul instructs us in the book of Romans 12 and verse 2. He says, do not conform to the thinking patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can approve and attest and discern the perfect will of God for your life. You see, we cannot discern God's perfect will. His thoughts that are higher with an unrenewed mind. And when you and I as Christians get born again, we're like a baby Christian. We've got the potential. Like my children, when they were born, they had the potential to develop a mind that was wiser. They had the potential to develop a mind that could do maths and this and that. Spiritually, when we're born again, we receive the potential to think the thoughts of God. Paul says, we've got the mind of Christ. When we get born again, we get reborn with the potential to develop the mind of God within us. So that we can think his elevated thoughts. So that we can operate in his superior wisdom. But it doesn't happen automatically. We have to meditate on the word of God. We have to delight ourselves in his wisdom. Wow. I wanted to say this. If you need counsel and you go to a, a counselor, a human counselor, whoever it is, whatever it is, make sure your counselor is qualified. Because many people and many sources are not qualified. How many of you like wasabi sauce on your sushi? On the green wasabi? Okay. So I'm going to give you an acronym. Was Can you say wasabi? Wasabi. Okay. But it's a little bit different. It's wasabi and then a P. Okay. Wasabi. The criteria for a, for a good counselor is this. He must have wisdom and knowledge. And we know Jesus is the holder of all wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is in him, Colossians 2, 3. Second thing, he needs authority. Make sure that your counselor carries authority. You know, when Jesus preached and taught the word of God, people said, he teaches different to the teachers of the law. He teaches with authority. Come on, unlike them. Make sure your counselor has authority. Jesus has so much authority as a counselor that his name means wonderful counselor. Make sure that your counselor has sympathy. How many of you have gone to someone for counsel or just to share and they had zero sympathy with you? And you're thinking, I'm not coming back to you for counsel. You always want somebody that counsels you to have a sense of empathy. And we know Hebrews teaches us that we don't have a high priest that is, that, that is not empathetic towards us. But he was, in fact, tempted in every single way that we are tempted. And yet he overcame. Therefore, he can have compassion and empathy with us. You see, Jesus has empathy with you. Seek a, a counselor that is accessible. Many times I ask someone, who's your spiritual leader? Who's your counselor? Who disciples you? Who mentors you? Who's your... And they say, no, my spiritual father is Brother Benny. I say, good, wonderful. When last did you have lunch with Brother Benny? No, 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 we don't do lunch. He's, he's in America. When last did you call Brother Benny and ask him for advice? No, I just listen to his teachings. That's wonderful. Listen to teachings and this and that. But you know what? A counselor needs to be accessible to you. Is it true? Yeah. Brother Benny cannot father me. 
Brother Ben, he cannot mentor me. He can teach me. He can learn this and this and that from his teachings. But he's not accessible to me. Come on, you want a mentor. You want a counselor that is accessible to you. Somebody that you can call in the middle of the night and say, Pastor, pray for me. Brother, pray for me. Salida, pray for me. Pray with me. Now, I just want to share good news with you. Jesus is the most accessible counselor that you can ever get. The psalmist call, he says, he's our ever-present help in times of need. God himself says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I am not too far for my ear to hear your prayers and my eyes to see your need. My arm is not too short to help you. And in, in the book of is it Hebrews 4 verse 18, he says, come boldly to my throne of grace so that you can find mercy and obtain grace for your time of need. We have an accessible counselor in Jesus. Next thing is that we need a counselor that balances truth and grace. Because, you know, some people are all about truth. If you come to them for counsel, they tell you the truth. But with no grace. No grace, zero grace. And it's very difficult to swallow truth without grace. It's very difficult to apply truth because grace is like the oil that helps us to swallow. It would be like me bringing a, a, a big fillet steak like this and saying to you, swallow this without chewing it up. Just look on it in. And I try and force it down your throat. That's truth without grace. But grace helps us to cut that fillet into nice medallions to barbecue it nicely, grilled on the outside, red on the inside. Cut it. Oh, my man. Like a balsamic vinegar sauce and olive oil on the outside. Oh, and like a season. That's grace, my man. Seasoned with grace. Other people are so full of grace, there's no truth in them. And God is saying, no, 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 you need truth and grace. Jesus, John, John 1, 14, it says, We saw, we beheld the glory of God as in the only begotten Son of God, full of truth and full of grace. You see, God's glory is only manifested when the counsel we receive is full of grace and full of truth. Amen. So make sure your counselor has grace and truth. And finally, make sure your counselor prays for you. You know, oftentimes as Christians... We are guilty of this. Somebody come and say, please pray for me. And we say, well, oh, brother, I pray for you. And then we never do. Come on, who of us have been guilty of that? That God be God and every man a liar. I've learned not to do that. Somebody says, pray for me. I say, come but someone now. In case I forget. If I'm remembered by the Holy Spirit later, I'll pray again. But let me just pray now for you, okay? But make sure your counselor prays for you. And we know that Jesus... Since he ascended back to heaven, he's seated at the right hand of God right now. And you know what he's doing at the right hand of God? He's offering intercessory prayers for us every single day, every single minute of hour and every day, 24-7. He's a counselor that intercedes for us. He says, God, let them turn to me for counsel. Let them come to us because we want to give them counsel. I want to tell you this morning the good news is that your counsel, your help, is only a prayer away. It's only one prayer away. James teaches us that in, in, in the first book. He says, he says, if any man lacks wisdom, come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you lack wisdom. You do. All of us lack wisdom in some area. If any man lacks wisdom, he should do what? He should ask the Heisgenoot. Ask God. Ask Dr. Phil. No, no, no. Ask God. Pray about it. Your wisdom, your counsel that you need is a prayer away. The power that you need is a prayer away. Ask God who gives generally without finding fault. Most of us don't go to God in prayer because we feel guilty and condemned about maybe not spending enough time with Him beforehand. Or maybe we feel guilty about this or that. But God says there's no condemnation. I will give you wisdom without prejudice, without finding fault. Ask God. Pray about it. 
But there's one condition. He says, such a man, if you ask, don't doubt in your heart, because a man who doubts like the waves and the sea that is washed to and fro, such a man is double-minded in his heart and should not expect to receive anything from God. You know, you could have made many mistakes. You could have even done some sin. If you ask God for repentance and you ask God for forgiveness and you ask God for his wisdom, he will give you the wisdom. But the only thing that will disqualify you from getting God's wisdom is double-mindedness doubting. If I doubt whether his wisdom is truly superior, he won't give it to me. Or if he give it to me, I won't even receive it because such a man can have no expectations from God. Zero expectation. Worst place to be in is double-mindedness. And so Jesus is not only our wonderful counselor, but he's also our mighty God. He's the wisdom of God, but he's also the power of God. And in the Old Testament, there was this name that God was called by, called the El Shaddai. God Almighty. El Shaddai means Almighty. Almighty appeared to Moses and Almighty appeared to Abraham. And he said, walk before me blameless. He's the El Shaddai. And the El Shaddai is such a beautiful name of God. It means the more than enough one. The all-sufficient one. Whatever you need, he is more than enough. Whatever you need, he is all-sufficient to meet whatever need you have in Jesus. And Jesus is the mighty God. He is the Almighty. You know, when Abram was 99 years old and childless and married to a barren wife in Sarah, the Almighty encountered him, the El Shaddai, and they were found with child. Not only that, but they got the promise that they will become nations. When Israel was facing the might of Pharaoh's army at, at the back, the might of Egypt's army, and the mighty Red Sea in front of them, and there was no way. It was God Almighty that told Moses, put your rod in, in, the, in the Red Sea, and he parted away and made a way where there seemed to be no way. When Israel was intimidated by a mighty giant Goliath for 40 days and the, the men were shaking in the armor and obviously there was not one man that would rise up and fight again. And God arrived in the form of a teenage boy, God Almighty, and delivered Israel. When Gideon had 300 men facing off against 300,000 Midianite warriors, God Almighty gave them a strategy that confused the enemy and turned the enemy upon itself. Daniel witnessed God Almighty locking up the, li the mouth of lions in the den. And Daniel witnessed three of his friends cast into the fire pit. And then they saw a fourth man, Jesus, God Almighty. And even the clothes on their skin wasn't even smelling like smoke or fire. It's God. That fire was so hot that the, the guys who were stoking the fire, opening the door, they, they burned dead outside. But those inside the fire, because they're in the presence of God Almighty, the El Shaddai would not burn. It was when Peter's boat and his nets were empty after a night of fishing, and he was an expert fisherman. He knew where the fish was. But after a whole night of zero fish, God Almighty came to the shores and said, cast your net one more time on the other side, Peter. And it was God Almighty that filled his net with a miraculous catch. Another time when the disciples facing a storm and they're bucketing water and they realize they're going down in the storm. This is their last night. And Peter says, I can't even swim, Lord. They saw God Almighty walking on the sea and rebuking the waves and the wind, and even nature responded to them. That same disciples once had five loaves and two, two fish, and that 5,000 men in their crowd, plus women and children, to feed. And they gave that five loaves to God Almighty Jesus, and He took that. And as He took it and broke it and blessed it, God Almighty multiplied it and fed the crowd. Oh, there was a woman that battled blood flow for 12 years, constant menstrual blood flow for 12 years, and she went from physician to physician, spent all her money, spent all her hope, spent all her energy, going from doctor to doctor, from hospital to hospital, from expert to expert, and nobody could find a cure until she touched the hem of God Almighty in Jesus, and she was made whole. 
I don't know what your problem is, but I know God Almighty this morning. I don't know what your need is, but I know that Jesus is both the wisdom and the power of God. And whatever your need is, He is the answer. There was a possessed man from the land of Gadaranes. He locked ten cities up, Decapolis, Decapolis. They locked him down with irons, thick, the thickest chains that you can get. They tried to lock him down. And he was so strong because the legions of demons infested him that he broke those chains loose. He could not be bound until God Almighty, in the form of Jesus, set foot on land on his shores. And he drove out the demons. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your battle is, but I know that El Shaddai, God Almighty, is right here, right now. You see, mankind's sin could never be forgiven or completely washed away until God Almighty climbed onto a cross and allowed himself to be nailed to a tree so that me and you can be washed clean of our sins. Jesus is God Almighty. And he's calling us to be mighty in him. He says this in Mark 16. These signs will, not maybe, might. He says these signs will accompany or follow those who believe in my name. The name that is above every other name, right? In my name they will cast out demons. In my name they will speak in new tongues. In my name they will pick up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and in my name they will recover. <laughs> Friends, Jesus is calling us to operate in his wisdom and in his might and his power. We believe in him. He says, in my name, you will do this. We will be hosting a Health Workers Appreciation Sunday on the 3rd of September. For more info, please contact the church office. City Spring Concert presents Night of Class on the 29th of September. Tables will be made available soon, so save the date. Our relentless inner healing retreat takes place on the 24th to the 26th of August. Please sit back, relax and enjoy the service.